You're listening to the A Bit From Within podcast with Felicia Marty. These are the things that I just don't either trust myself on or I want more validation or I wish I had different answers. And then there's probably this other sector, this other bucket of things in your life that you're like, nope, I trust myself on these things. I listened to my gut here. I listened to my heart. I listened to my body start to lean on that information that we do have, that we can trust ourselves, that we do know more than we think, and that we can find out the information that we really need. Hi there, everybody, and thank you so much for joining me for the today's episode of the Up It From Within podcast. I'm Felicia, and I'm coming to you once again from inside of my closet. I just had this moment where I was sitting here thinking about a way I can change my setup because right now I have this, um, actually it's a really cool chair that like kind of folds up and turns into like a mini stepladder. Um, and it sits in my closet and holds my laptop and my microphone. And then I sit on a meditation cushion and here surrounded by all the clothes. And, um, you know, I have just grown so fond of having these moments and um, being able to record the podcast in this way. Um, I've been in the works of talking with a couple different people who are up for coming on to the podcast as guests. And so it's making me so excited for the future of this podcast and the kind of conversations that we're able to have and what I'm able to put out into the universe. Hopefully it's very helpful for everyone. Um, but I was just thinking, you know what, it's time to elevate the situation here. So honestly, it's probably a little past time, but that's kind of how I do things. I, I have learned very slowly about myself that I, it takes me a while to really develop an idea and think things through. And I, I'm so, um, I'm such a type one Enneagram in the sense that I really like to do things the right way. And I say that in quotes because even with saying that, I know that there's never just one right way. There's many ways to do something. Um, but in my head, there's like a right way. And so I like to take my time to really make sure that I'm doing the right thing. So even when it comes to the closet, you know, part of me is like, okay, what would that actually look like? Do I really need to even keep recording in the closet? And if I do, maybe I can kind of build like, um, something that can drop down. It's not a big closet. I mean, I guess that's relatively speaking, it is bigger than an average closet, but it's not like a entire room or anything like that. And so I would have to kind of finagle the right way to create some sort of desk. But, um, anyway, I'm not going to drown on in thoughts that I haven't even fully developed around that. Um, but I do think that part of the reason I'm so, um, inspired right now is that Dave and I just finished a really cool project for our home. Um, we've been wanting to, for, a very long time, do some kind of accent wall in our dining room. And so we finally, you know, with this stimulus money that came in, one of the things that we'd been talking about, because we've been doing really good at saving money just because, you know, he's full time now. We've got, you know, adulting is is tough. You always want to have a lot of protection, but um, we've been wanting to get a miter saw for a while because both he and I love the idea of doing woodworking and want to create things. But if you don't have the tools, you know, you're kind of at the mercy of what you can create. And so we were, we've both been talking about this for a really long time. So we decided we're going to get a miter saw. We're going to go ahead and start kind of a, a, a baby project just to kind of get our feet wet and, and kind of get the ball rolling. So we created this board and batten wall in our dining room and, oh my gosh, we had so much fun putting this together yesterday. Um, I was honestly very nervous about the whole process and project because I have never felt like I'm very good at math. I feel like if there's somebody who's going to mess up calculations, it's going to be me. Um, I actually remember when I used to work for Starbucks and I was a shift supervisor and um, every once in a while I would be like the one in charge of like having to do the tips for that week and figure out the tips And inevitably I would always screw it up somehow. Like, I mean, I had people who helped me figure it out the right way, but I'd sit there and have to do it like five times over just to figure out. I don't remember. I've like blocked out how you even calculate that kind of thing now, but 
Anyway, all of that is to say I was really nervous about figuring out the measurements and the calculations, um, but I did it. I did it by myself. I kind of took that part of the ownership of the job on, and I had read a bunch of different blogs and different ways you can do it. And so we got all of the tools we needed, and we did it yesterday, and it turned out amazing. So I'll try to describe it so that you could you could visualize this. But um, basically, when you walk into our house, there's a long hallway that kind of opens up into the open dining room and kitchen and living room area. And so the wall along the same way is the entrance way. That's the one that we did this accent wall on. Um, and it kind of works out perfectly because after you get out of the hallway, the, the wall like opens up like two inches to the left. So there's kind of a more defined space of the dining room, like where the dining room actually is. And so we put the board and batten about four feet up the wall. So kind of like chair rail height. And then above that, we painted it this, um, I believe it's called Diver Blue. It's from Claire.com. Um, they're the same colored paint that we did for our upstairs accent walls. And it's actually the same blue that we did in our office, but I am obsessed with this blue. It is so pretty. Um, and we actually also painted our, like the front of our island, that color as well. So gosh, it just, it makes the room so much bigger. It changes the whole vibe of the downstairs. I can't believe we didn't do this earlier, honestly. And it just fills me with so much inspiration because, um, when you can make something yourself, you just feel so powerful. Like you're like, wow, I created this. This is my idea come to life. It's so inspiring. Um, and now Dave and I are both just like, we could make this and we could build this bed and we could make these. Actually, I, I really want to make these different nightstands that I saw. Um, but anyway, so if you hear me talking about more random projects, it's because we're trying to, um, get inspired and build more stuff for ourselves, and really looking forward to that aspect of this summer. You know, it's so important to have things in your life that you're passionate about. And I feel like, I so often fall victim to, you know, a lot of my passions are also things that I do for work. And so there's always that gray area. You know, somebody asked me a long time ago, like, should, if I really love photography, should I become a photographer? And, you know, my first thought to that was no, because, um, well, and it really just, of course it depends, but I think that you run the risk of any time that you are super passionate about something, if you end up doing it for a career or to make a living, um, you run the risk of not loving it anymore. And so you have to have a very clear relationship with how much you love to do that thing and why. Um, and if you are very passionate about something that you do for a living, it's important to find other passions in your life that can be outlets that are not your work. Because for me, I think I fall victim sometimes to just being like so into the photography business and even so into yoga and creating the podcast. And um, there's so much joy in there, but there's also elements of obligation and responsibility and accountability. And it's not always 100% of the time just fun. Um, now, most of the time it is, I would say, like going out on sessions with couples, um, go, being at wedding days, connecting with patron members, talking about yoga, talking about meditation, mindfulness, um, self-improvement. All of that is so inspiring for me, and I love that part of what I do. But uploading files and emails and writing checks and things like that, that part's not always fun. And so... Um, anyway, very much on a side, side tangent there, but all of that is just to say that I'm very excited to have this kind of new passion in my life. Um, and the passion may not be new, but the capability of being able to act on that passion is new. And, you know, I've just been thinking about it. I kind of will segue into today's astro check-in. Um, you guys know the sun is in Aries now. It's been in Aries since um, March 21st, March 20th. Yeah, March 20th. And it's starting to feel like spring. Like it's really starting to feel like spring. Last night, there was the most gorgeous sunset um, that kind of, kind of, filled up the entire sky. And it's one of my favorites because in the neighborhood, when I go to take Brad out that time of night, 
there's like this peace that washes over me when you feel, you can see the kind of pink colors of the sky bouncing off of the houses and the reflections of the windows. And it's so calming. And it kind of had this moment where I'm like, oh, spring is coming, like summer is coming. We are entering a new chapter. So there's a lot of change in the air. And I'm so excited about this. And I feel like Aries is this such this beautiful energy to en- usher in spring and change and life coming into existence. And with it is all of this energy behind movement, like creating movement in your life. And so this this season of Aries lasts until about April 20th. So we've got, you know, quite a bit more time in Aries. And I feel like you got to remember that Aries is a precursor to Taurus. And Taurus, I think, is a little bit more of your spring cleaning kind of energy, although you might feel that already. I definitely have been feeling that. But I but I like to think of Aries and Taurus kind of in tandem in this this time period before you actually do feel that moment momentum to clean out your closets, like vacuum your carpets, like do some of that deep cleaning, get rid of things, get new things into your house. And I think that so much of that has to do with this um, precursor Aries energy of like putting yourself first, standing up for what you need. You know, if we think about it, there's so many times throughout the year that small little adjustments happen, you know, like somebody gives you something and then you set it by your front door and then that turns into, you know, moving it into your closet and then, oh, you mean to do this with such and such, but then that doesn't happen. So then, or you buy it and it doesn't work, but you keep it and you get a new thing. You know, there's so many tiny little things that add up throughout a year where suddenly we're filled sometimes like I'm the way I'm talking about it is like our physical space, but this can also happen emotionally inside of ourselves, right? Like we make little accommodations for other people. We don't bring up a real problem because we know that that might hurt the such and such person's feelings. And we agreed to start doing this thing. And now that we're into it, we feel like we can't say no. And so now that's happening, but it's not great for us. And before we know it, if we're not careful, we have kind of given away all of our time or all of our energy or all of our space because we've given away to everybody else and for everybody else. And we forget where we are. We forget to take up our own space or to kind of reclaim our own self inside and outside. And so Aries is going to be that warrior that can help you kind of reclaim that space. So this is that time of year where it's really important to maybe start thinking about, okay, where do I need to take action? Where are some of the places either in my physical home or in my car or in my job um, that I need to redraw some boundaries or I need to create some new habits? Um, Same thing with your relationships. Um, it's interesting because we just had this beautiful full moon over the weekend, which was in Libra and Libra is a sign that's opposite of Aries. So whenever there's signs that are opposite of each other, there's a polar, uh, polarity, whereas Aries is all about the self and about being a trailblazer and kind of putting things into motion. Libra tends to be more about balancing and about relationships and about interacting with the other and putting the other first. And so right now, especially this past weekend and into this week, there's going to be this feeling of needing to balance how much you're putting yourself first and how much you're putting others first. And we all know that, you know, too much of one or the other is not a good thing. So this is the perfect time to reclaim what you need for yourself. And maybe this will be the precursor, just this moment to decide before you put stuff into action. Um, and once we get to Taurus, which I'll talk about in a couple of weeks, Taurus is going to be much more about being very practical and putting um, plans in place, taking action, being very methodical, working through things. Um, but Aries is a fire sign and it's much more spontaneous. So great time just to listen to yourself, just to get your energy back up, maybe start exercising, start going on walks, start getting a little bit more activity in, just start to wake yourself up a little bit more. 
And I can share that that's what I've been trying to put into practice right now. I've been really focused on trying to get my workout in each and every day, trying to increase how often I'm moving. Um, And then also like actually putting some of these ideas into action around our house. Like what can we do to breathe more life into our home? I know that I need that. Like my soul needs that, especially working from home, having been here, having gone through this whirlwind of a pandemic in this space. Um, We all need that, you know, fresh coat of paint to reinvigorate us. Um, And maybe it's not on your physical walls, but maybe it's just with little things in your life. Okay, guys, we're going to take a quick break. And then when we come back, we're going to dive into the topic of listening to yourself and listening to your body. So kind of along the lines of what we've just been talking about, we're going to put a little bit of a twist on it. You guys know that there's always this element of my podcast and of all, probably all my work that it has this message of you need to listen to yourself. Like no matter how many podcasts you listen to, including mine, like I can't tell you exactly what to do to be that magic reset button in your life and make everything in alignment, right? You're the only one who can do that for yourself. And I think one of the things that we all can struggle with from time to time, and and maybe some of us are better at it than others, um, but it comes into this, this idea of listening to yourself. And I know that this is something that in some ways that I have done well, but also something that I've really struggled with. And I am assuming that probably many of you are like me, that there's like a handful of things that you're like, for some reason, like these are the things that I just don't either trust myself on, or I want more validation, or I wish I had different answers. And then there's probably this other sector, this other bucket of things in your life that you're like, nope, I trust myself on these things. I listened to my gut here. I listen to my heart. I listen to my body. Um, and so, and maybe, so maybe we've had experiences with both. And one of the things that I was reflecting on yesterday are like, when are the times that I feel like I really listened to myself or especially to my body? And there was a significant payoff for doing so. Um, and then also on the opposite, like, what are the times that I did not listen to myself. And I wish that I had listened to myself. Um, for me, you guys know the story of my kind of big panic attack that happened to me in 2019. And that is a time in my life that I always go back to. And I try not to be too hard on myself, right? Like we don't want to beat ourselves up always for the things that we can't change now. But there is a part, if I'm being honest with myself, that I have this regret that I just didn't listen to myself that day, that I didn't pick up the phone, call my friend who I was supposed to meet at the pool and just say, hey, I am super stressed out. We just bought a house. I need a moment to breathe. Now, we can't, of course, change what happened, but I can't help but wonder, like, if I would have done that, I would have taken that breather, calmed down maybe had a a moment to journal, reflect, bring my nervous system back down, would have taught yoga that night, and then would have everything have been fine? Or, you know, would the same kind of thing have just happened? Like, would I have kept kind of ignoring my body even more and ended up in the same situation, just in a different time and place and space, you know? And we'll never know. Um, and I'm, and I don't necessarily want to change every, I don't want to change the past because I am grateful for where it's brought me and for what it's taught me. Um, but that is definitely that time that I can pinpoint without a doubt. I wish I would have listened to my body then because my body was absolutely sending me all of the signals that I was burnt out, that I was stressed out, that I, that it was all too much for me. It was all very apparent looking back on it. And I think that for me, stressed out and burnt out are often the roads with like the the warning signs on them that I just kind of put my blinders on and keep cruising down. I can think of so many times in my life where my mind can get so focused on what I need to accomplish that it it's like it overrides all of my body signals of, 
you are stressed, you need a break, you need to sleep, you need to put this down, you need to stop going. It's like I can almost get so obsessive about completing a project or or getting things off of my to-do list that I do not listen to my body. And I... I almost even, I actually am having this moment right now as I say this, where I'm feeling so guilty for not listening to my body the way that I need to, for, for dismissing it in that way. It almost makes me feel like, you know, when we were all kids, when we were trying to, when you're trying to get attention and you're trying to be so clear and just nobody is seeing you. And that, you know, is a wound that I feel very familiar with. And I think when I put it that way, like, why don't I do a better job of actually listening to my body, especially dur- during something like that? Like, why why are we so quick to dismiss signs of burnout and stress and tiredness um, and and so quick to say, oh, it's OK, I'm going to I'm going to I don't want to let that friend down or I don't want to reschedule this appointment or I or I don't have the time off of work, or I, I want to save my vacation time for an actual vacation. So I'm just going to push through this. I mean, I do think that part of this is a cultural problem that we have in the U S that we are obsessive about work and we do not have enough provisions to actually take care of ourselves in the right way. Um, that it definitely does not create a culture for listening to your body. I mean, even when you think of being a kid and, you know, like when you were allowed to be sick, when you were allowed to miss school, how many days of school you could miss. Um, I mean, nowadays I feel like it's much more common to have kids that are like, Hey, I need a mental health day. Like we, we've kind of coined this phrase, but you know, when I was growing up, that, that was not a thing. Um, and our, our parents, um, especially many of us who have like boomer parents, like that was a mental health day is like not a thing. (laughs) Maybe for some of them now who have um, learned how important it is for us to take care of ourselves on the inside and the outside, because it's all this giant feedback wheel, right? We know that when we are too stressed, when we are too tired, that we don't make as good of decisions. Um, We know that being mentally fatigued and burdened leads to being physically fatigued and burdened. And then the cycle perpetuates, right? Because when we are physically so stressed out or burnt out, we are more likely to get sick. We are more likely to have our body sending us all of these other signals through disease, right? Like I say, like dis-ease, um, that we are, are haven't been listening to ourselves maybe the way that we should. And that is not to put any blame on ourselves for what we're going through. I want to say that as a huge disclaimer before I continue to talk, because the last thing I would ever want anyone to feel is that, um, some kind of medical medical condition that you're facing is your fault. Um, that is absolutely not anything that I'm trying to say here. So please, please know that. Um, but this is just to give a little bit of context to this, something that just, you know, planting that seed of thought, something to consider of how is your relationship to listening to yourself. Um, another time that I didn't listen to myself when I wished that I would have is when I started doing yoga. Um, And what this really brings up is that when we are in a vulnerable place, as far as our hearts, maybe you're in a new relationship or you're in a new job or you're in a new space of fulfilling a dream. Um, Or like for me, when I started doing yoga, I was so vulnerable because for me, there was so much happening on the inside of me around worthiness, around being enough, about proving myself. And because yoga was this avenue that I was finding so much about myself and so much great self-discovery and confidence, there was also this vulnerability around pushing myself farther than I, than I should have. And okay, so here's the truth is like, you don't know what you don't know. So I started doing yoga in 2011 and I was a a dancer previously as a child. I've always been quote unquote flexible. And what I didn't know then is that 
I'm actually hypermobile. So my joints move very freely. And um, in yoga, yoga is kind of idealized, at least especially back then, as being, you know, this practice where you are more trying to pick the right words here, but you're kind of, your ideal is to go deeper into the pose. And so that kind of has this idea of being very flexible, of finding your flexibility of, you know, being able to kick your leg up over your head or find the splits or move into a, a huge back bend. And so when you are hypermobile, you're more apt to be able to access those poses as opposed to people who are less mobile. Um, people might say like stiff like, um, but really like their joints are just very secure. Um, and there's probably tightness and, and all of that stuff there too. And so we can work to stretch the areas that we have tightness. We can work to achieve more flexibility. Um, but what I've learned after many, many years of doing yoga and becoming a yoga teacher, and then, um, discovering that I do have hypermobility and that I do need to work a lot harder at my, at being strong than being flexible. Um, it's just opened this huge, this huge kind of mind blowing can of worms kind of, because there's so much that I didn't know when I was first starting to do yoga. And so much of it for me is tied into horrible, horrible back problems that I had, um, through those first, you know, three, four, five years of doing yoga. And again, not to, you know, just sit here and harp on regret. I am so grateful for where I am right now. And I'm grateful for all of the teachers who taught me. I know that they all did the absolute best that they could and that they didn't have any other knowledge to give me, but I will always look back and wonder, what if I would have practiced yoga right from the beginning with this piece of knowledge that I need to approach different yoga differently than the cues that most teachers are giving? I need to um, protect my body. I need to focus on strengthening. I need to not even go deep as deep into poses as I quote unquote can because I need to work on being stronger. And I, I wonder how many years of um, kind of heartache that I would have saved with my practice um, because there's still this ego part of me, you know, inside my head that still some, for some reason um, feels like because I'm not practicing vinyasas every single day that that makes me less of a yogi, which I could just smack myself for saying that because I know that that is absolutely not true. And when I think about it from, you know, my higher self from my true self, I am so grateful that I became a gentle yoga teacher because I feel like there's so much in gentle yoga to help you be more rooted into the real practice of yoga, the roots of yoga, the mindfulness aspects. Um, I know that it's not actually about how fast you move or how um, flexible you are. That's so, so not the meaning of yoga. Um, but there's always that ego, that ego part in our, in our self that we have to kind of face and, and that we have to learn how to cut through to get to the truth that we need, right? And I, it's so, so part of the reason that I love meditation as a daily part of my spiritual well-being, because I feel like the more mindful that we are, the less apt we're, we are to fall down those roads of the ego, of it trying to pull us towards success and, um, you know, honestly, things that we can't control, um, things that we feel like we can control or things that are going to give us this external validation as opposed to trusting what's happening on the inside of ourself and what's really in line with our highest good. And I think that that's the voice that we have to work to cultivate, right? It's like listening to ourself and listening to our body. So, um, I thought I would share just a, a couple of stories on the other side of that, of the times that I have listened to myself and I'm glad that I did. 
And again, just another little kind of disclaimer, none of this is medical advice because I am no doctor and I have no answers. And in some of these areas, I feel like I feel still feel like I don't have answers, but I'm still glad that I listened to myself. Um, so the first one is a kind of a funny story and, and mom, I apologize in advance for sharing this with the world. Um, but I don't think you'll mind too much. Um, Okay. So when I was in middle school, it kind of started this, um, this series in my life where I just fell over a lot. I guess you could say I was super clumsy. Um, I, I don't remember, you know, which fall happened first. I remember I had a really bad ankle sprain after I had slipped on some ice, um, in middle school. And I had another fall, like down some stairs, um, in middle school as well. And I, I remember the number by the, but by the time I was in high school, um, I think I had had 26 different ankle sprains on my right ankle. So it was always my right ankle. And my last one happened actually in Florida on a, it was a senior in high school. We were on like a Disney world trip with the choirs and we were at the beach and I rolled my ankle in the ocean and it was huge. It was like the size of like two softballs on either side of my foot. And, um, I remember coming home from that trip and telling my mom, like, mom, I need to go see a doctor about this. Like, this isn't normal for me to keep, I literally, it was so comedic to the point by the time, like I was a senior, like I would just be like walking and all of a sudden I'd just be down. Like it would happen out of nowhere. Some of the most embarrassing moments of my high school, like falling in front of boys that I was in love with. I mean, it was, it was super embarrassing. And she was a little bit like, uh, I don't know if we really need to do that, but okay, I'll take you to the orthopedic surgeon. And sure enough, you know, they do a, um, like, is it an extra, can x-rays show your ligaments? I don't know. They did some sort of (laughs) imaging on my foot and they were like, yeah, we need to schedule you for, for like a ligament repair surgery. And I was like, yep, sounds good. Please fix my ankle. And my mom was really not comfortable with this. Like for some reason, like, and I'm sure she would have her own side of the story, but I just remember her like not wanting me to have surgery, not thinking it was important, like not, wanting me to go under anesthesia. I'm sure, I mean, I'm sure it was all out of love, but like we definitely had this disagreement about whether or not I should have the surgery. And so sure enough, like we ended up going forward with the surgery. It was scheduled for like one week after I graduated from high school. And sure enough, when they got into my ankle and the ligament, they found that it was just barely holding on by just like a couple last little pieces, you know, kind of like, um, a rubber band. You can picture like when you, a rubber band starts to break, there's like tons of tiny little strings. Um, it was pretty much like that, like just like holding on by like a single thread. Um, and that summer, you know, was kind of hard. Like I hobbled around on crutches and in a walking boot and, um, it was, there was a, a production that I was in that summer. And so like I was dancing on my walking boot and then I had to have it replaced cause I had like worn it out so much. And then I was supposed to go to a lot of physical therapy, but instead I just kind of got my, my cast off and then just started doing my thing, um, dancing on it and whatnot. And so anyway, all of that is to say that I have rarely fallen since then. I think I don't think I've had like a true ankle sprain since that surgery. Um, I think I maybe have fallen like once or twice, usually on the other leg or whatnot. Um, honestly, there was like a huge fear of falling for me that I kind of carried after that. And I still cannot watch people go down like in, you know, like funny fail videos or whatever, like fall, like people like to watch people fall for some reason. I can't do it. It just like causes me like PTSD or something. It really freaks me out. Um, but I am so glad that we did that and that we listened to the doctors or like that all lines up to get my, my ankle fixed because I feel like my quality of life has improved so much. I've probably experienced so much more with my body being stronger in that way. Um, and that, that is invaluable, right? Now, 
This next story, as far as listening to yourself, is a little bit more complicated because when I was in high school, again, I was diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome. And a lot of women are diagnosed with PCOS, um, women of all different shapes, sizes, ages, ethnicities, like it presents in a bunch of different ways. Um, and so of course the standard practice for when you were diagnosed with PCOS, especially back then was like, just get on birth control that will give you regular periods and that will solve everything, which is just absolutely bonkers. And there's a million reasons why that's a horrible idea. Like you're basically just suppressing symptoms, making the body act like it's functioning one way. You're not addressing what's happening at all. There was no talk of diet or managing it or other ideas out there. It was just like, this is what you do. And so I had tried it and the birth control that they had given me made me crazy. Like I just remember being like angry and mean and emotional and like out of control. And so quickly got back off of that. And sometime in college, I had started going to work with an endocrinologist who, um, was somewhat helpful. Like they kind of helped me identify that I am insulin resistant and kind of identified that as maybe part of the problem. And so they had put me on like a bunch of, you know, just you go through these hoops. Like they're like, try this drug get this amount of prescription and try this. Okay. Now we're going to do this drug plus this one. And I had done this for like several years And the whole point of being on these drugs was to help me lose weight, to get my body there. The theory was if we can get your weight down, then your body will behave how it's supposed to. And then everything will balance itself out. And I was, I would say in like the three years that I was on all of these injections and pills and all of this stuff that I maybe lost like 10 pounds, like it was not significant at all. And so finally I remember this is probably when I was really starting to become more spiritual. Um, And I say that because, I mean, I grew up very religious, um, but this was a time in my life where I started really developing a much more of a relationship with my um, spiritual self, like my connection to the divine, actually starting to understand more and see the universe in a different way. And Um, I just remember feeling like this overwhelming sensation that like, I am done. I'm not going back to the endocrinologist. I'm getting off of these medicines. Like I didn't, there was no downside to just stopping these. It was like, you're going to stay the same weight that you are and still have the same PCOS. And that's still going to really not be that big of a problem until you want to have kids. So, I mean, what, what did I have to lose? Right. So I just stopped. And it was at that same time that I was on Google on a forum that um, somebody had written this uh, theory about like, if you want to lose weight, if you have PCOS and you want to do it the natural way, they said, go on the no white diet. And essentially what that means is like no white rice no white sugar, no white bread, and no white potatoes, white potatoes. They were like, cut, cut those four things out of your diet and everything else will even out. And so I thought, well, what do I have to lose? I could try to fight this naturally. And so I did that and started like doing just like home workouts, like 30 minutes a day or going on a walk 30 minutes a day. It was my only expectation, like cut these foods out and do, move and in the next two years, I lost like, like 45 or 50 pounds. I, I forget exactly how much now. Cause I've, I've gone up and down and up and down. Um, but it was, it was amazing and I felt so much better. And it was, it kind of led me up to the point that I got really into yoga, which continued to help me. And I would say that it completely solved the symptoms that I was having for PCOS and it helped me remember like we are powerful and and that is not to say that we don't need doctors if you guys listen to my you know podcast a couple um 
weeks ago, I was talking about how my primary care, care physician really helps me with my panic attacks. But I think the thing that we've probably all have some kind of important story in our life on is that we have not been able to trust every single doctor that we talk to or every single trusted advisor or every single teacher, right? Um, I remember when I was in high school, just a a really quick side story. Um, I had a teacher who basically told me like, you will never be a writer. You're a terrible writer. And it really crushed me because at the time, like I, I dreamed of being an author. Like I would have loved that. I still would, if I could pick any, um, pick any, job out of, you know, the universe. I would love to just write books. I feel like it would be the best job ever. Um, but when I was told that at such a, again, vulnerable age, I just immediately was like, okay, that's it. And it wasn't until my senior year of college that I was actually writing plays that got great feedback that I started to believe in myself a little bit again, that was like, maybe that person just wasn't right. Maybe she was just having a bad day and she took it out on me, or maybe writing is a subjective thing and maybe I can be a writer. Um, So all of this is just to say that it's up to us to always listen to ourselves, to cross check every bit of information, every um, time we collaborate with somebody to trust our guts. Is this the right person I should be talking to? Is this the right decision for me? Is this the right path that I'm on? Is there something that I'm not listening to that my body is trying to tell me or my mind is trying to relate to my body and vice versa? It's so it's all interconnected. So all of that is just to say, it's very important for us to listen to ourselves. So throughout this next week ahead, see if this, you know, maybe it's jogged any stories in your life. Of course, I'd love it if you'd share them with me. Um, Maybe this will kind of spark you to give yourself a little bit more credit if you've been feeling like a little stressed out or burnt out, or maybe you will in a couple weeks. Maybe you think back to this episode and you think, I'm going to, I'm going to log off early. I'm going to cancel with that friend. I'm going to go to bed early. I'm going to listen to myself. Um, I know that's what I want for myself. And like I said earlier, we all have moments and places in our life where we're good at it, but let's see if we can kind of identify some of those areas that we are less skilled with it and start to lean on that information that we do have, that we can trust ourselves, that we do know more than we think, and that we can find out the information that we really need if we're open to it. So, um, all right, you guys, let's go ahead and pull a card. Um, I've got the affirmators, love and relationships deck. (sighs) You guys know, this is one of my favorite parts of each and every week. All right. This one says initiative. Step right up. You're being awarded a boost of initiative. This potent potion will give you the gusto you need to move your life in a previously unexplored direction. If you're in a relationship, then it's time to take initiative and make some interesting plans for you and your partner. If you're not in one, it's time to reach out to old friends, go on adventures, and potentially meet some new cohorts. Either way, this great journey is beginning with one small step. Mm. That brings us full circle because I think initiative goes so well with Aries. And it brings us right back to this idea that it's time for us to start to look at things in a new way and start to explore the areas that we haven't explored that we so deeply need to. So I hope that this um, finds you well, that it inspires you, and that it keeps you thinking or contemplating things until the next time that we talk. Um, 
If you haven't had a chance yet to check out our Patreon page for A Bit From Within, there you will find all of the ad-free episodes of this podcast, but you'll also find a huge library of guided meditations and yoga classes and different astrological guides um, that are really fun to dive into and explore and help you with your well-being practice. So use them implement this time into your life and keep pursuing your own well-being. Thanks for letting me share a bit from within today and until next time.